In this video, I want to introduce you to an unusual tool in the novel writer's arsenal called Chekhov's Time Machine. It was named in honor of Anton Chekhov, the famous Russian playwright. I will show you how a bit of time travel can help turn the thin soup of your first draft into a meaty ragu. And for inspiration, we'll be taking bus number three to the high street. So, welcome to another installment in my series on how to write your novel using that most unlikely of writing implements, a round Oxford bus ticket. The point about Chekhov's time machine is it enables us in our writing to deploy something that I call weaponized serendipity. To understand what this means, let's consider the eternal debate between so-called plotters and pantsers, a debate that has divided the writing community for quite some time. Plotters plan their novels out in meticulous detail. Pantsers, by contrast, write by the seat of their pants, which is to say, they make it up as they go along. The best formulation of this philosophy behind pantsing that I know of comes from E.L. Doktorov, who once said, Writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Now, plotting is obviously more rational and efficient. You don't waste time going down numerous blind alleys. But sometimes those alleys turn out to be not so blind after all. You can make all sorts of serendipitous discoveries when you don't quite know what it is you are doing. If you have the confidence to trust fate and set sail, you will discover things in the process of the writing that you could never have foreseen at the start. This is Magdalen College, where author C.S. Lewis taught English literature for 29 years. According to Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia started life as a simple image of a fawn carrying an umbrella and parcels in a snowy wood an image that popped into his mind when he was 16, and which one day blossomed into The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, about which he said, At first I had very little idea how the story would go, but then suddenly Aslan came bounding into it. I don't know where the lion came from or why he came, but once he was there, he pulled the whole story together, and soon he pulled the six other Narnian stories in after him. I want to show you how we can use serendipity deliberately and with premeditation. If you can have such a thing as premeditated serendipity, using Chekhov's time machine. I've shown in a previous video that the first draft is where you just get stuff down, come hell or high water. You don't care whether it is any good, it is a sand with which you will build your sandcastle. Indeed, the first draft is for discovering what your story is about. But if, once we've got the words down, that is when the magic starts. This is when you use Jacob's time machine. The idea was inspired by his famous maxim about the gun on the mantelpiece. There are numerous variations of it, but essentially it says, if you put a gun above the mantelpiece in the first act, you should make sure it goes off by the third, otherwise it shouldn't be there. But for me it works the other way around. If you get to chapter 11 and you need a gun on the mantelpiece and you don't have one, you take the time machine back to chapter 3 and write one in. To see what I mean, let's invent a novel set in an English country house in the 1930s, the sort of place Agatha, Agatha Christie would have set one of her whodunits. Imagine you arrive at chapter 23 of your novel and the vicar attempts to ravish the maid. The plot requires her to shoot him, but there is no gun hanging on the wall. Damn, you think. I forgot to mention it when I described the maid dusting the room the previous autumn in chapter 12. So you travel back in time to chapter 12 and insert the gun. But you know, readers will not be impressed if the maid suddenly turns into Calamity Jane. It will strike them as a bit too convenient. You need to foreshadow it. So you return to the previous autumn and invent a scene in which she learns how to shoot. Perhaps she's taken the gun down from above the mantelpiece and is cleaning it. The Duke's son walks in and jokingly holds up his hands and says, Don't shoot! And the maid replies, well, she couldn't even if she wanted to do because she doesn't know how. Now, since the maid is very comely and the Duke's young son would like to get his hands round her waist, he offers to teach her to shoot. He puts his arms round her to demonstrate the technique. 
She aims at the Asp district in the hallway. She fires. Bang! <laughs> and exactly at that moment, Aunt Agatha walks in. The look of horror fills her face as she falls to the floor dead. Well, now when the vicar attempts to ravish the maid, the reader will remember the shooting lesson and it won't feel contrived that the maid knows how to shoot. But we've introduced a new problem. The maid won't even get to chapter 23 if she's arrested for murder. So we invent some new plot developments. The Duke's son is no slouch. Thinking urgently on his feet, he decides to make it look like Aunt Agatha shot herself. He puts a gun in her hand and rearranges the crime scene. Well, it's just another normal day in an English country house. But this introduces another difficulty. We need to make it psychologically plausible that Aunt Agatha would do this. So we take the time machine back to chapter 2 and insert the story of Aunt Agatha's great love affair with the World War I biplane pilot who got shot down over northern France. And when the news came, Aunt Agatha was so heartbroken she attempted to take her own life by swallowing arsenic. And she spent the next 10 years confined to an asylum. See how the story continually develops in unexpected ways? And maybe the policeman who is called to the scene knows Aunt Agatha well. He used to play bridge with her. And he knows she is left-handed, but the gun is in her right hand. Aha! Uh -huh. Or maybe the whole thing was observed through the windows by the gardener. Well, then we can travel back in time to chapter, chapter 1, when the maid first arrived at the house. The gardener was totally smitten by her and made his feelings known to her. And she rebuffed him. Well, the boot's on the other foot now, isn't it? He now knows she's a murderer and has some powerful leverage over her. Will she have to shoot him too? Who knows? But you can quickly see how intricate webs of new possibilities come into being. Ideas which you might never, might never have occurred to you when you sat down to plan. I recommend you construct a Chekhovian time machine of your own and learn to drive it. And if you'd like to build a wardrobe that leads to Narnia, you should download my free 10-part email course called Gateway to Narnia, telling you how to write your first novel. The link is in the description below.